Welcome to our example of a thermal expansion problem when you actually have a gap and your thermal expansion may close the gap. We have two different materials here as well to really give you a great example of sort of multiple things happening. So this should add to any information that you received in class regarding thermal expansion. And so if we look at this problem, what we have is we have a member made of two materials. It has a 350 millimeter section that is bronze and a 450 millimeter section that is aluminum. And the aluminum end happens to be fixed to the wall, so we're fixed on the right side. On the left side, at the brass free end, we actually don't quite make it to the, to the wall and we have a half a millimeter gap. Problem is, this system now experiences a 96 degree Celsius temperature increase. So we have a positive delta T. And so we know uh, that both of these materials are going to expand. But they're going to expand by different amounts because they have different uh, coefficients of thermal expansion, which you can see listed under the bronze and the aluminum. And they also have different lengths. So they have different lengths over which to expand. And so the problem sort of gives it away. I mean, the first question you would want to ask yourself is, is any force or stress going to develop in these members? And basically it would mean, is the gap going to close? Is the thermal expansion going to be enough to close the gap? So the problem actually, what we're looking to solve is, what is the compressive force due to delta T, which sort of gives away, yeah, that gap's going to close. And once we find what the compressive force is after the gap closes due to the 96 degrees Celsius, what would the new length of the aluminum bar be due to that change in temp? So the very first thing we kind of want to look at is just how much overall deformation does the system want to experience due to the 96 degrees. And we know that deformation due to temperature is going to be a function of those coefficients of thermal expansion, the amount of temperature change, delta T, and the original length. So we could start with the bronze and just determine how much does the bronze want to expand due to the 96 degrees Celsius. And if we plug in our temperature and length, we find out that it wants to expand by almost three, well, I'd say three quarters of an inch, but we're in millimeters. So basically 0 0.726 millimeters. And the aluminum, it wants to expand when we plug in our coefficient of thermal expansion, the temperature, it wants to expand just a little bit over one full millimeter. So 1.002 millimeters. And both of those, as we can see, are larger than the gap. And if we add those up, we get a total temperature um, displacement of 1.278 millimeters of displacement. So we're definitely, definitely closing the gap. All right. But not all of that deformation is going to cause a force, right? Some of that deformation, um, the bar is free to undergo, and we've established if a bar is free to expand, no force or stress develops. So the actual deformation that will cause a force has to be that deformation the wall has to resist, which would be the total Deformation due to temperature minus the gap, or our 1.728 millimeters minus 0.5 millimeters, the gap, which turns out to be 1.228. So if we want to figure out then how much the wall is going to resist, we have to now look at our new system. And our new system is a fixed-fixed system. And we don't necessarily know now, I don't want to deal with the temperature or anything, but we can draw this now once the gap is closed and recognize that this system has to resist a deformation of 1.228 millimeters. 
all right? And as it resists that 1.228 millimeters, it's gonna develop some forces. So it'd be good to draw a free body diagram and show both the bronze and the aluminum. We know we're gonna have a force on the wall on the bronze side. We know we're gonna have a force on the wall on the aluminum side. And if you were to cut a section at any point, and just look at what's happening in the brass or just look at what's happening in aluminum or if you just think about drawing the overall axial diagram of this hopefully what you can see by observation is that the force in the brass is going to equal the force in the aluminum which is going to equal the force in the wall. It's all going to be constant. All right, so I got ahead of myself there and started drawing the next step, but what we want to draw is the redundant force method is what we want to move to. So we can draw our member, and we can show just one of the ends fixed. So I chose to show the end by the brass as now fixed, and I removed the redundant support at the aluminum. And so obviously underneath that, um, under, under the influence of the 1.228 millimeters, we're going to expand by 1.228 millimeters. But with our redundant force system method, we say that we obviously must draw a second member. It has to have the exact same support conditions as our first member, but then show the missing support, the redundant support of reality, at the free end. And so we'll show the force of the wall and show that we will compress by whatever that force is. And of course, our compression formula is PL over AE. Now, if this is going to work, our redundant force method are two members added together. They max or match the fixed fixed case if and only if the if we can add the 1.228 to the deformation due to the force on the wall and they add up to zero. So that's the formula that we're going to want to solve. And the thing is, is that if we're going to get the force on the wall, that's actually going to be both a function of the deformation of the brass due to the force of the wall and the deformation in the aluminum, I'm sorry, bronze, not brass, but the um, deformation also in the aluminum due to the force in the wall. They both experience the same force, but they have different areas and different E's and different lengths. So we can just write out our equation. So we would have our <clears throat> original deformation and then the deformation on the wall at the bronze, so our 350 length, 1500 millimeter area, and our E is in gigapascals, but I can write that as kilonewtons per millimeter squared. That's the same as a gigapascal. And then we write the deformation of the aluminum to the wall. So we use the area of the aluminum and then E of the aluminum, which would be 73 kilonewtons per millimeter squared. Remember, a megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. So a giga would be a kilonewton. And so we're going to end up with these expressions that would just have... Um, millimeters per kilonewton as our force and it looks like forgot to write what the um, forgot to write the force of the wall in the equation so both of those constants should have the um, force of the wall in there both are negative and both those equations should have been set equal to zero so basically I can resolve this for the force on the wall and we end up getting back out that the wall force equals 217 kilonewtons. So now that we've expanded by 96 degrees Celsius, we're able to expand through a half an inch, half a millimeter. We hit the wall, and then the wall pushes back with 217 kilonewtons to resist that additional 1.2 to eight millimeters that our wall that our that our member would like to expand but can't because it hits the wall. Now 
we also want to see in this problem how long is the, the new length of the aluminum bar. We know the aluminum can't expand through all of that half an inch. It can't take it all because the bronze wants, bronze wants to expand some too. We can't assume that it only expands a half of that, I said half inch again, half of the millimeter. We can't assume that the aluminum uses a quarter of a millimeter and the bronze goes through a quarter of a millimeter, we have to realize that they're both going to expand by how much they want to expand to the temperature and they're both going to contract by however much 217 kilonewtons would cause each individual member to contract. Con contract. So that's great because that kind of tells us how to approach the problem. So if we want to get that new length in the aluminum we can go back to information we already know. We know how much it wants to expand due to the temperature change. We already calculated that. That was 1.002 millimeters, and that was if it was free to expand. Now, if we can determine how much the aluminum actually contracts or compresses, due to the force in the wall, due to 217 kilonewtons, we can, which we can easily do by plugging into our PL over AE equation, what we can find is that the aluminum wants to contract or compress by 0 0.74 four three millimeters and of course that's negative because we're compressing all right and so all we have to do now is add those two together and that's going to be our total new length well add those together and then add that to our 450 millimeters and obviously we do get some expansion because the deformation to the temperature is greater than the deformation due to the force in the wall and so if we just sum those with our original length, we find out that our new length is going to be 450.26 millimeters. And we're done. Um, if you want, a great check would be to go back and see how much does the aluminum, I'm sorry, how much does the bronze want to change length? And it should turn out to be about 0.24 millimeters. There's a little bit of rounding going on in here, um, especially because <laughs> reporting out to 450.26 millimeters starts to get us into some silly significant digits, but um, you should find that the aluminum wants to expand a little more than half the distance and the bronze expands a little less than half the distance. So I hope this helps you to see how to look at the different materials individually. Also, look at how a point moves. This basically tells us that that junction between the brass and the aluminum shifts to the left by 0.26 millimeters. All right? So, I hope you enjoyed this. Thermal expansion is a lot of fun, and it's a great use of the redundant force method. Thanks for watching.